Hello, oh, and um, welcome to our latest food and consumer product litigation and regulatory update. Uh, I'm Trent Taylor. I'll be sort of your host and MC of today's program. We're very, very happy to have you attending and very happy to be uh, back doing this. Um, the last one we did was back in March, so we've had, um, you know, it's, it's been some time since we've um, done one of these and it is time for another update because there have been a lot of developments. And as you'll probably know, we try to have fun with these and, you know, what's more fun than doing one of these on Halloween. Um, so um, thanks a lot for joining. Um, we have a great program for you here today. Here are our speakers, um, really a top notch group who are all subject matter experts in their respective fields. Um, and here is sort of the roadmap of what we are planning to do today. We're going to start with a Supreme Court preview from um, Katie Barber, who's a former Supreme Court clerk herself, and, and she has a lot of insight um, and um, is going to talk about some of the upcoming cases that may affect um, these industries. Um, next, I'm going to talk some about some recent trends that we're seeing, as well as food labeling litigation. I will then turn it over to Royce and Allison, who will give an update on regulatory developments, uh, followed by Jenny Price, who will be handling product labeling litigation, Frank Talbot, who will be handling sales practice litigation, um, and then uh, Talene Geddes, who will be handling the Prop 65 issues. Um, as always, I wanted to just mention that we love questions. So if you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A um, de uh, device on this platform, and we'll be happy to try to answer it either um, written on the platform, or if we see it and um, we are able to discuss it on, uh, you know, as part of the webinar, we'll do that. And if for some reason we are unable to get to it, then we can email you later with our answer. Um, and also just a reminder, if you have questions later, like, you know, two weeks from now, you're like, oh yeah, I had a question about that particular thing. Feel free to email us and we'll be happy to try to help you with it. Uh, we enjoy very much talking and thinking about these issues. All right, uh, as is probably obvious, our theme today is Halloween and spookiness in general. Uh, and each of our panelists will be sharing their favorite candy. Um, and if they want a favorite Halloween or spooky memory, feel free to share your own in the chat or Q&A button, uh, especially if it's something outside the norm. Everybody seems to like the same types of candy. So if you have any ideas about other candies, that we should know about, by all means, let us know. All right, we're gonna. I'm gonna turn it over now to Katie, who's gonna give us the Supreme Court update. Thanks, Trent. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Katie Barber, um, and as the slide notes, my my favorite candy is probably a pretty typical one: the mini Reese's cups, not the regular size, because the mini have the uh, the correct proportion of filling to uh, chocolate. Um, I'm going to be covering our um, Supreme Court preview, uh, and as this slide notes, it really is the this term, this October term that just started at the beginning of this month. Um, it really is spooky season for the administrative state this term. Um, this term is not really so far, it does not promise to have some of the kind of big um, socially divisive hot button political cases that we've seen in some of the past terms. I, really the, the theme here, and um, that makes it a great one to talk about for this group, the theme of this term I think is really challenges to the administrative state. Um, so we have multiple cases uh, that all are you know, raising pretty extreme significant challenges to, to different aspects of um, uh, agency action and the administrative state, the executive branch and how it operates um, and that could have some serious implications for all kinds of regulated industries and, and agencies. Uh, so we're going to start with, uh, we have a pair of cases that are asking the court to overrule or at least constrict Chevron deference, which is the, the principle that uh, courts should defer to reasonable agency interpretations of ambiguous statutes. Uh, we then have a challenge to the CFPB and how it is funded. Um, 
And then we have a challenge to multiple aspects of the SEC's uh, enforcement structure <clears throat> that uh, that could have some ripple effects for, for other agencies along with the SEC. So starting with Chevron, uh, we have this pair of cases that, that raise basically an identical issue. Uh, the court granted both of them because uh, Justice uh, Jackson, our newest justice, was recused in Loper Bright. Um, so there were only going to be eight justices uh, hearing that case. And then Relentless uh, came out of the First Circuit raising the same issue. And all of the uh, all of the justices can hear that case. So the idea is that the court probably <clears throat> granted the second case so that all nine justices could weigh in on this really important question. And the important question is whether the court should overrule its its 40 year old precedent uh, from Chevron versus Natural Resources Defense Council. So in that decision, um, 40 years ago, the court held that when an agency uh, has its a statute that it has implementing authority over. If that statute is ambiguous or silent on a particular question, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, the agency has authority to to interpret um, that ambiguity uh, in, in its own regulations, and that that interpretation, so long as it's reasonable, should be given deference by Article Three courts. So this these both of these cases arose in what are pretty standard. Uh, typical Chevron cases. They are both challenges to a rule promulgated under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which is an act aimed at uh, promoting sustainable fishing, um, avoiding overfishing, and it, it uh, requires uh, fisher, fishermen, commercial fishermen, to uh, comply with these different fishery management programs. And as part of those fishery management programs, uh, they can be required to carry fishery observers on their boats. What the statute doesn't say is who pays uh, for those observers. And so the National Marine Fisheries Service, the agency that implements this act, promulgated a regulation saying that uh, the industry has to pay for these fishery observers. And so there was a, a, a kind of standard Chevron challenge to that rule saying you know, this is not a reasonable interpretation of the statute. And part of the argument being that the statute, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I have the, whatever uh, preschool bug my kid brought home this past week. Um, so part of the uh, part of the issue here is whether the statute is even ambiguous. Does it even speak to this or is it silent? Um, and the D.C. Circuit and the First Circuit both held uh, that the statute was silent. Uh, but the that the agency's interpretation was a reasonable one. <clears throat> um, and instead of even deciding to review this kind of basic question of whether that's a reasonable interpretation, the court didn't even take up that question. What the court took up was the question of whether the entire idea of Chevron deference should be overruled. Um, there is a caveat in the question presented uh, where the court asked uh, is, is also asked should it at least clarify that if a statute is silent as opposed to ambiguous um, that the basically silence does not qualify as ambiguity uh, so these this pair of cases is going to be argued in january 2024 um, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens here uh, the supreme court has been really not a fan of Chevron for a while now. Um, the court has not applied or cited Chevron um, in a decision since 2016. Um, but at the same time, Chevron is something that is used all the time by lower courts. And it's a really important tool for lower courts um, and uh, is used all the time and is a way that also you know, allows kind of the, the administrative state to function um, while for agencies to promulgate these rules that are implementing implementing statutes. Um, I think the, my sense here is that the court is probably not going to go so far as to totally overturn Chevron. That would be a, a pretty extreme step. Um, but I do think the court will likely constrain it. Um, it may take this out that the uh, that the question presented gives gives the court, which is to say, when a statute is silent, that does not qualify as a kind of delegation of authority by Congress 
for the agency to interpret the statute um, and, and that here the statute is silent on this question. And so there was not this kind of implicit delegation to, to the agency to, to engage in this kind of um, rulemaking. At the same time, um, again, the court has been really critical of Chevron deference. Um, and there are multiple kind of constitutional challenges raised to it here. Uh, the idea that that courts are basically abdicating their judicial authority um, and deciding to not, you know, they're, that the court's primary role is to decide and say what the law is um, and that they're not doing that when they defer to an agency interpretation. Um, and there is also a non-delegation um, doctrine challenge, which is the idea that Congress can't delegate policymaking authority to the executive branch. Um, and that's also had some receptiveness at the court. So there could be an appetite to really make this kind of big sea change of overturning Chevron. And if that does happen, you know, that really impacts every agency um, and could impact all kinds of regulations. Obviously, the exact impact could depend would depend on uh, what various statutes say what various regulations say um, and it would take a while to probably play out um, to see all of those those effects but um, it could be a pretty significant one so stay tuned okay um, the next one that i think is probably going to end up being less significant although it you know on its face could could be a, a major one um, but based on uh, watching the argument that happened earlier this month I think it's going to probably end up being a bit of a, a nothing burger um, so this case um, it comes out of Fifth Circuit as does the next case we're going to talk about so one theme you'll see in this term as well is that the Fifth Circuit we have a conservative court right it's really moved to the right over the last few years but it hasn't moved as far right um, I think as especially the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit is widely regarded as the most conservative court in the country right now. Um, and it's it's really pushed uh, to the very far right extreme in some of these cases. Um, and the court is not necessarily showing a willingness to go quite as far as the Fifth Circuit and as some litigants are, are pushing it to. Um, and so I think you're going to see that play out in this case. Um, this a case is a challenge to how the, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, is funded. Um, basically, the CFPB gets to decide its own funding level. Um, there is a cap, but the cap is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and it, it uh, increases every year based on um, inflation. And they basically the CFPB gets to say, we want X amount of money this year up to this cap and request that from the Federal Reserve. Um, and the Federal Reserve itself is also, is not funded by yearly congressional appropriations. It's funded um, by its own system of fees. And so the argument is that uh, this system violates the appropriations clause, which says that, uh, you know, nothing can be done unless Congress has has a. Uh, has made a, um, a funding decision by law. Uh, and so the idea here is that Congress is not making yearly appropriations um, or regular appropriations to the CFPB. The CFPB kind of has this independent or almost doubly independent funding system. Um, this challenge came out of, it, the reason this could be pretty significant um, if the court were to go the direction of the Fifth Circuit, that this challenge didn't come out, it, it came out of a kind of normal challenge to um, the CFPB's payday regulations. And the idea being that, um, you know, so payday lenders were challenging these regulations and saying that because the CFPB's entire funding structure is unconstitutional, every regulation that the CFPB has promulgated while using that funding structure uh, is invalid. So a really kind of broad ranging remedy saying that because there's this unconstitutional structure at the core of the CFPB, nothing the CFPB has done basically is um, is valid. Uh, and the Fifth Circuit adopted that, that view. So that also a pretty extreme remedy to both say um, both that the funding mechanism is, is unconstitutional and that because of that unconstitutional funding mechanism, everything the agency has done um, you know, basically goes away. Uh, so I think here you saw at oral argument, um, 
that there was not a lot of receptiveness from the court to that view, uh, even from members of the court that you might have thought would be receptive to it. Uh, it was not an argument that went particularly well for the petitioners. Um, their arguments were a little, ended up seeming a little confused. Um, and you had justices, uh, justices uh, Amy Coney Barrett was, was really grappling with well, how does your argument, your challenge really square with the text of the appropriations clause, which broadly read just says, you know, if Congress passed a law saying how you get funded, that's enough. And here there's a law saying how the CFPB is funded and that's enough. Um, uh, you also, Justice Thomas seemed confused about what, what the petitioners were even arguing. Um, and so this is a case that came to the court really seeming like it could have these serious implications for the CFPB. Um, you could end up having, you know, basically the CFPB, anything the CFPB has done getting thrown out after oral argument. And you, you can't always read too much into oral argument, but I think here you probably can. Um, it doesn't necessarily seem like the court is going to go in that direction. Um, and, and, and that's pretty consistent with the court's history of uh, how it's treated the appropriations clause. Uh, the court, these types of challenges don't arise that frequently, but the Supreme Court has never held that, uh, has never found a violation of the appropriations clause. Um, and the Fifth Circuit in the decision below is the only other court, the only court to have ever found that um, a congressional statute was a violation of the appropriations clause. So I think you're going to end up consistent with that history, uh, also not finding a violation here. Um, but if you were to find one, that really would have wide-ranging implications for both CFPB action and potentially other, other types of agency action. Um, but again, I think my prediction, at least so far, is that it's probably not going to go go that far. Uh, all right, our third and final case, the one that I think probably will have the most, uh, could um, be on the Chevron case, or in addition to it, uh, would have could have more serious implications for uh, federal agencies and, and uh, um, regulations uh, is a Securities and, and Exchange Commission versus Jarkazy. Uh, so this case raises multiple kind of thorny, interesting constitutional questions um, about agency structure and agency enforcement actions and um, related issues. Uh, so it arises out of um, uh, an enforcement action that the SEC brought against a hedge fund manager, um, charging him with securities fraud. And the way the SEC is structured is the SEC has uh, discretion to decide whether when it brings this type of enforcement action, charging someone with securities fraud, whether it brings it in an Article Three federal court or whether it brings it in its own administrative uh, court own administrative proceedings. And when it brings um, such an action in its own administrative proceedings, uh, there's no jury there. Um, there is basically the SEC acting as the prosecutor and then the, the person who kind of decides uh, liability or not is uh, an SEC administrative law judge. So the argument is that you don't have a jury and you kind of have the SEC as as both prosecutor and judge there, um, and that that and so the first challenge to that structure is that uh, it, it violates the Seventh Amendment right to a jury, um, in particular because in these proceedings the SEC can get civil penalties and disgorgement, um, which is exactly what it did here. Uh, and the SEC, uh, so the second challenge is also that the SEC's just that its ability to make this choice about where it brings enforcement actions um, in federal court or in an agency proceeding, that that is a viola violation of the non-delegation doctrine. So non-delegation came up um, with in the Chevron case too. And again, it's this idea that uh, Congress is not cannot delegate its legislative or policymaking power. It's a doctrine that has not actually been used by the Supreme Court to to strike down a law since 1935. Um, and because since 1935, the court has basically said, 
uh, Congress can kind of delegate this authority if it provides an intelligible principle um, for the agency to, to use um, when it's acting. So basically an intelligible principle that guides the agency's exercise of its discretion, um, then you're okay. And the court has basically upheld any challenge um, based on the non-delegation doctrine in the last century. Uh, but there is a push from some members of the court, um, specifically uh, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, um, for a more strengthened, for a return to a strengthened non-delegation doctrine um, and a, a return to the principle that you just can't delegate uh, policymaking authority at all, regardless of having an intelligible principle, kind of abandoning even the intelligible principle rule. So that's the second challenge there. The third challenge is to the way that SEC ALJs um, are protected from removal. Uh, so the, the president um, is required under the Constitution to be able to take care that laws are enforced um, and the argument is that when uh, you have too much removal protection for uh, an executive officer, that that prevents the president from being able to, ex to act under the take care clause. Here, uh, ALJs in the SEC uh, can only be removed for cause. And similarly, they're kind of the head of the agency, the commissioners also can only be removed for cause. So the argument is that this double for cause removal protection violates um, the take care clause uh, in Article 2. The Fifth Circuit, so the Fifth Circuit coming up again here, um, accepted all of these challenges and said, yes, the SEC's enforcement structure and its ALG, ALJs um, are unconstitutional on all three of these grounds. Um, and so you're going to have this case argued in, in a few weeks, about a month at the court. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see which of these uh, arguments the court does or doesn't latch on to and which it's kind of the most receptive to. Um, I think the non-delegation doctrine is the, the part of the case that could have the most serious implications um, and ripple effects across federal agencies uh, because a broadened or strengthened non-delegation doctrine could really be the basis for challenges to all kinds of agency action. So for example, um, the FTC has this broad authority to define and then um, act on uh, what it defines to be unfair and deceptive trade practices. There could be a non-delegation doctrine argument that that ability to define what, what qualifies as unfair and deceptive trade practices and to then um, pursue enforcement actions based on that definition that that um, is an unconstitutional delegation of policymaking authority. Uh, and you see that, um, so that could, you see that in other agencies and, and kind of across, um, across the map. Uh, but I, I think here, this is not the case for the non-delegation doctrine to really um, prevail because I think the, the, uh, the ability to choose where to bring an enforcement action um, seems more plainly like a type of executive authority, a type of prosecutorial discretion than it does a type of policymaking authority. Um, so while the non-delegation doctrine here could be the one with kind of the most serious, um, serious implications, I think it's probably not going to be the one that the court seizes on, though we'll see. Um, uh, I think probably the the Seventh Amendment issue um, could could get some traction, and then especially the four cause removal protection um, could also be be what the court kind of seizes on. Um, and I think, in either respect, the court is probably going to take some steps to further restrict the SEC's authority. And in doing so, it's going to have implications for other types of agencies um, beyond just the the, uh, the SEC. Again, the FTC, the CFPB, they have some similar enforcement structures to the SEC. Um, so holdings on either of those um, bases could have implications for, for them. Um, ALJs are also used across, uh, across um, um, the executive branch, basically. There's, uh, there's, I think, twice as many ALJs as there are Article Three federal judges um, in, in the federal system. And so they're used a lot. Um, at the same time, holding that they have to have a, a 
the, the for cause removal protection has to be removed is not that serious of an implication. It basically just means that um, uh, they would be removable at will and it wouldn't necessarily totally kind of obviate their use or or um, fundamentally change the way that the system is structured. But depending on how the court comes out on one or all of these um, constitutional issues, there could be these, you know, these serious ripple effects for um, the SEC and for other types of federal agencies that um, that this audience uh, interacts with. Um, so that is definitely another one to, to stay tuned to and just the, the term in general, I think, is going to give us some interesting insight into um, how this court is going to continue dealing with the administrative state and kind of paring back um, its authority. With that, I'll turn it back over to Trent. Great. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, and, you know, I, I, I especially like and respect that you went out on a limb and uh, gave your prediction on these, which I know is always hard to do. So um, we will not hold you to it, um, but <laughs> it is very that. helpful, very helpful to get that insight. Um, so we are now going to move into something else. What, one thing I guess uh, I will say is um, my favorite candy is Tarm's Blow Pops. And that may seem like a strange choice, uh, but my my father was a, or is a civil engineer and he built the Charms factory in Covington, Tennessee. And as a child, I used to be able to go and tour it. And if you've never had a Blow Pop fresh off the assembly line when it's nice and warm, uh, then you haven't lived. Uh, and we used to get boxes and boxes of these um, you know, around Christmas time that my brother and I would eat. And um, let's just say there were a number of cavities in our household. Um, I, I no longer eat them. So I now eat peanut butter m ms but you know, I have a special place in my heart for charms low pops. Um, okay, I'm gonna be talking about trends, um, sort of high level trends to start with. And the first one is, um, and let me just make sure, are we good on slides? Okay. Slides sometimes get a little bit behind, so I just want to make sure we're on the right slide. Uh, the first trend is sales practices, enforcement, and litigation are on fire. And if you hear nothing else today, just understand that um, this area is blowing up, and you should be aware of it. Uh, I've been to a number of sort of recent conferences, and one of them um, there was a speaker who noted that this first uh, bullet point on FTC and CFPB announcing new rules to tackle junk fees, they said that is one of the biggest developments in the advertising and, and even the, the retail space over the last 20 years. So uh, it's a big deal and something that we're all going to want to watch very closely. Um, Another speaker said, and this is a quote, the FTC is obsessed with dark patterns enforcement, end quote. Um, so Frank is gonna talk about this in a little more detail later, um, but there is a lot of activity um, right now um, about this. There's the junk fees and the junk fees is not just on the federal level, it's also on the state level because California recently enacted um, a, a law on that as well. There's the recent FTC suit, not only against Amazon, but some of its executives for dark patterns. And that is very rare as well. And I think shows how serious the FTC is about enforcement in this area. Um, there have been a number of other sort of state laws that have been passed, one of them being the Right to Repair Act in California. And then a number of lawsuits targeting all sorts of sales practices. Frank's gonna talk about some of them. We also have a slide on a new or somewhat new uh, focus of the dark patterns litigation, which is targeting urgency practices, which uh, have to do with scarcity, whether it's, you know, you don't have very much time left to, you know, get this particular bargain or you know, this, the tickets or the hotel rooms or you know, widget X is about to run out. 
there's only 10 left, so you better hurry and buy it now. Um, there have been a number of lawsuits and regulatory actions focused on that as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I did want everyone to just know that this is a big, big issue here. And of all the things that we've seen uh, and that we'll be talking about today, this may be the one that's blowing up the most. And, you know, as a long time um, followers of our webinar, um, you probably have seen that we've talked about this before and we've said that it's coming. Well, it is now here um, and it's going to morph out into lots of different areas. Um, but, you know, just be aware that it's out there. And if you are in this space, then you need to be paying very close attention to what your sales practices are, what your quote unquote dark patterns are online and taking steps to in, you know mitigate the risk there. And if you need any help with that, let us know. Okay. Trend number two. Um, this is just one that I, I just sort of noticed. Um, and, you know, it's not something necessarily like new per se. It's been sort of a slow evolution of the Ninth Circuit. But I remember, and I'm sure y'all probably can as well, if you go back, say, 10 years, the Ninth Circuit was sort of the bane of the existence of many in the industry because they were expanding the law, especially in labeling litigation suits, um, you know, quite a bit. And a lot of some of those would go up to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and lots of times the U.S. Supreme Court, if it went up, would would reverse. And we always used to joke about how I'm sure Katie can probably attest to this as well about you know when there was a case that came out of the Ninth Circuit that went up to the Supreme Court, then if you were putting money down on the result, you almost almost always put money on it being reversed. Um, that is no longer the case because the Ninth Circuit. Um, now, after a number of conservative appointments during the Trump administration, uh, the pendulum has swung back and it's no longer really seen, um, at least in a lot of cases, as outliers, uh, as an outlier court. Um, now you're getting some good decisions for industry. And here are a few that I just you know, wanted to flag that are you know, very recent. Um, the McGinnity one in particular is interesting uh, because I wouldn't really say it walks back the, the the prior decisions of the Ninth Circuit that essentially said that you know a statement on the back label uh, cannot be used to cure uh, a deception uh, on the front label, but it, it, it sort of is um, you know, something that waters down that view to a certain extent and allows defendants to make a whole host of arguments, um, you know. On the, uh, with regard to the back label and what's on the back label to a greater extent than they have perhaps in the past in the Ninth Circuit. Um, ESG claims. And this is something that we always talk about, or at least for the last several years have talked about. And I think it's been one of those things that we have said, pay attention to this, this is coming as well. And there was a time, I think, um, that we thought, well, we sort of expected it would be here by now, but it, it, it's really just the trickle. That is starting to change. We're starting to see more of these type of cases. Um, we're starting to see activity, not just um, with you know class action lawsuits, but also in AD decisions, um, you know, regulatory decisions, state legislation, all sort of focused on ESG claims. And you know, one of the ones I wanted to note was there was a NAD decision on net zero claims by JBS um, back in, I believe, late spring. And um, you know, the challenge claims included things like JBS is committing to be net zero by 2040. Um, you know, bacon, chicken wings, and steak with net zero emissions is possible. The kinds of statements that a lot of folks are making um, out there, and the NAD said that these net zero claims reasonably created consumer expectations that its efforts are providing environmental benefits, specifically net zero carbon emissions by a specified date, uh, and that's a measurable outcome. And while the NAD recognized that the record provides evidence of a significant preliminary investment JBS has made toward reducing emissions by 2040. 
it found that it does not support the message conveyed uh, by the claim that JBS has a plan it is implementing today to achieve net zero operational impact by 2040. So that's something that I think if uh, you or your company are you know, trying to make some of these environmental claims such as net zero or sustainability, that kind of thing, um, just understand that there's a lot more scrutiny of those claims now, um, not just by class action lawyers, but regulators and then these industry groups, um, you know, like NAD as well. So, um, and that scrutiny is sort of tightening the screws on these. And it's, it's important to um, substantiate it to the greatest extent possible. There's also been a number of recent um, class actions on focus on this space to a greater degree than we've seen. I mean, there was a you know period of time where we had a couple of quarters where there weren't a whole lot of these, but we're now seeing, seeing them ramp up. And, you know, we have one in California about that. I think Jenny's going to talk about a little bit later as well about, um, you know, claiming against Delta airlines, um, challenging the claim that it's the world's first carbon neutral airline. Um, and there's there's one in New York about Evian Water being carbon neutral. There's this, uh, you know, there was a recent case in Missouri, in St. Louis, where the court dismissed a claim uh, related to sustainability. Um, and then you know, there's the the one that I, we have here um, on the third bullet point related to um, organic standards and animal care practices and um, that those are not puffery and they are actionable. So a lot going on in this space. It's important um, if you are making claims in this space to be aware. Um, the, the last trend sort of high level that I wanted to mention, and this dovetails a little bit to some of the things that Katie was talking about and certainly relates to the National Pork Producers Council case from last term is state enforcement and the dormant commerce clause. And you know, this is perhaps a longer term trend to watch. Um, but you know, it, this does bear watching because you know I, I do anticipate there's going to be a lot more um, state enforcement um, that is going to come about both in terms of legislation as well as you know state AGs, that kind of thing going after certain kinds of conduct, certain kinds of claims. We're already seeing it on the dark patterns front where there's, you know, state AGs and even counties are going after a number of uh, various sales practices. Um, this EATS Act, that is the first bullet point here, is, is, is very interesting because it's uh, an act that was, um, that has been introduced in Congress that would reverse the outcome of National Pork Producers Council and ban state level agricultural regulations um, that would you know, impact agricultural production in other states. Um, and this has created quite a stir. Um, and I know that there were a number of state AGs, I think 15 state AGs who recently voiced opposition to, the, to this uh, proposed law and said, and this is a quote, this act is a severe incursion into the rights of states and local governments to regulate agricultural products sold within their jurisdictions, and Congress should soundly reject this invitation. Uh, 30 U.S. senators uh, signed a letter in August saying that, the le that this legislation would create a quote-unquote overnight regulatory vacuum, um, killing state and local laws that regulate food production, even in circumstances where there is no federal law. Um, and, you know, this, I think we're, we're seeing, um, you know, this rise of state AG enforcement, new, more aggressive state legislation. I've already mentioned the Right to Repair Act in California, the junk fees, um, you know, ban in California, as well as, you know, laws in Massachusetts, uh, Washington and other states related to PFAS packaging, uh, you know, dark patterns, some of these other, you know, pork producing, those kinds of things. And then you add in this extra element that Katie mentioned about Chevron deference and perhaps the curtailing of the executive branch, and you could see a big shift back to the state level in terms of enforcement. 
and you know a number of new state restrictions with you know state legislatures now understanding and realizing that um, with national pork producers they can pass legislation they might not have considered in the past so almost sort of a new federalism and i think it's going to be something that we should all bear watching you know, the bears watching down the road okay um, so those are the high level trends. I'm now going to get down into food and beverage labeling developments. And the first trend that I wanted to flag for everyone, and I apologize that this, you know, this, this slide has a lot of text. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a visual guy, so I always like to have some, you know, art as well, but, um, at a certain level, you know, these are some of the recent geographic origin cases, and we wanted to illustrate for you that there's a lot. And that's a little surprising to me because, you know, we watch this area and there's always been sort of this trickle, you know, made in the USA suit here, maybe, you know, something else related to, you know, Hawaiian beer there. Um, but we have seen an, a real uptick here. And some of that may be explained by some of the, the, the new made in the USA rules that our partner Reed Smith talked about on our last webinar back in March. Um, but it, you know, it, it's it's other things as well. And you know, one of these is a big settlement, uh, twelve million dollar class action uh, settlement uh, related to Kona Coffee. That case has been going on for a long time. And there's been a number of settlements, but that's the latest. It does show that there is money to be made by plaintiff's counsel in this space. Um, you know, there um, are a couple of new made in the USA claims that we flag here. There's one about popcorn uh, being from Indiana. Um, and, you know, whether or not that's really uh, something that is going to dupe a customer. The court found that it, 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 that would not dupe the customer. I think it's still an uphill battle for some of these claims. Um, but, you know, some of them are getting past the motion to dismiss stage with the Craig, the American tuna case being one of them. Um, but the bottom line is this, we're seeing a lot of these kinds of suits. And if you were making one of these claims, you know, be aware that this is sort of a popular target right now for plaintiffs class action lawyers. All right, the next one I wanted to mention, and you know, it, it almost sound like a broken record here because every time we do one of these webinars, we talk about natural. And you know, I, I keep wondering if uh, this will ever end, um, but I, you know, it, it doesn't. Um, it, it was sort of the original label claim that was targeted in this litigation, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and it still has legs, it's still, if you are you know, doing the numbers in terms of um, which labeling claims are targeted the most often, this is you know, every single quarter consistently in the top two or three. And the latest sort of focus has been on uh, ingredients like malic acid and ascorbic acid. And, uh, and they continue to file these. And the, one of the reasons they continue to file them are, uh, if you see the, the bottom two here, um, they both got past the motion to dismiss stage. And that has been consistently true for the last few years. And, and, and frankly, to a much greater extent than other types of these labeling cases. Um, so, you know, if, if you have uh, a product with these ingredients in there, then obviously pay very close attention um, because, you know, this is, uh, something that plaintiff's counsel is looking very, very, very closely at, and they're filing lots of suits, and they have an excellent chance to get past the motion to dismiss stage. Um, Microcontaminants. So microcontaminants, um, this is also something that we've talked about in the past, um, and there have been sort of these various feeding frenzies um, with certain kinds of microcontaminants, the, the heavy metals one, um, has, has been a popular one in, in, a, in a variety of different foods, chocolates, uh, baby formula, um, baby food as well, and they continue. And so this is not over, um, but PFAS is another one. And, and you know, when, when PFAS, uh, there were a couple filed maybe a year ago, maybe probably over a year ago, and we thought we would see this big wave of them. 
and we really haven't. We've seen, you know, a, a trickle of them, certainly some of them, but not as many as we would have thought. But I think it is worth noting that there have been some new ones filed um, recently, and I think maybe the Plans Council will be watching how these bottom two fare, and um, and then we'll see whether or not, if they get any legs or get past the motion to dismiss, whether we see more of them. Um, so wanted to flag that particular trend as well. Um, and then there's a number of other recent cases that don't really neatly fit into a particular category. Um, there, are, there were, I believe, two or three suits about the exaggerated size of hamburger patties that, you know, got a lot of um, press attention. Um, there, you know, was one related to whether raw honey is actually raw. Um, you know, fruit cocktails not actually being in 100% juice. Um, the the bottom one a suit targeting sprouted grain claim on Starbucks bagels mostly uh, survived a recent motion to dismiss. And then uh, a healthy claim on Gatorade Fit um, has been targeted as well. Um, so those are some of the, the things that we've seen. The exaggerated size of hamburger patties, um, those were dismissed in part because the plaintiff, I believe, um, admitted that the actual weight size of the burger that they received was the same as in the ad. Um, but, you know, I guess what I would say, and what is obviously significant about this, is that Plaintiff's Council will focus on anything they can. And even in, you know, if you're running a commercial or have a picture of your product somewhere and maybe you blow it up a little bit, um, they notice and they will try to monetize it if they can. So um, obviously just keep that in mind. Um, and then here are a few recent important decisions to be aware of. Um, and, and I wanted to focus on a couple of these. Um, one is this Reynolds case at the very top here. And that's from Judge Chabria um, in the Northern District of California. And I know that these two, that the, the two marketing claims that were targeted in that suit, which were good for you and part of a healthy balanced diet, those are two very common marketing phrases. And so I wanted to flag this particular case because I think it provides some insight on those. And, you know, I, I'm not going to speak as to whether just Chabria is in the majority on this or not. Um, and, you know, just Chabria is, is never one to back down from an opinion. Um, but he ruled that the good for you qualifies as an implied nutrient claim and that the suit targeting that claim was preempted but denied the motion to dismiss as to the claim part of a healthy, balanced diet. Um, so I don't know if there's really an answer there other than to say, number one, preemption, and this is something that Jenny's gonna talk about later, continues almost surprisingly so to be a really good defense in some of these cases. Um, but also you gotta be careful with healthy and good for you types of claims because they are being targeted some of them are being successful, some of them are not being successful, but at least some of them are getting past the motion to dismiss stage. As you saw on the last slide, there's one targeting healthy claims for Gatorade as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, the, the, the last one here, the Clamor case, you know, these protein cases, there was a rash of them um, a year or two ago, and um, you know, the Ninth Circuit uh, affirmed the dismissal of one of them, or a few of them, I think, recently. Uh, but here's an example of a case that is getting past the motion to dismiss suit. So these protein cases may still have legs. Um, and then for our um, friends who manufacture dietary supplements out there, I urge you to take a look at this First Circuit case, the DeCroce AV McNeil Nutritionals case. Um, it alleged that the defendant marketed lactate, lactate as a dietary supplement while claiming that it treats the disease of lactose intolerance, which makes it a drug, 
and they asserted Massachusetts law claims for unfair or deceptive trade practices, but the trial court dismissed, and then the First Circuit affirmed the dismissal, uh, finding that federal labeling laws preempt her claims. So I think that's an important one to look at if you are in that space. Um, and the last thing I will mention uh, real quick before I turn it over to Allison is there is some new FDA draft guidance on sesame. Um, so if you are, you know, have products that contain sesame, be aware of this, as you probably know. Um, sesame was added as a major food allergen on January 1st of this year. But the FDA, there's been a lot of uh, turmoil about that, and the FDA released some draft guidance to um, further address major food allergen cross-contamination related to sesame. And so if you're in that space, um, just be aware they have that out there and it's worth uh, reviewing. And then the summary is, as you can see here, if you, you know, I think I've already mentioned this, if your products contain ascorbic acid or malic acid, watch out. If you're making geographic origin claims, watch out. If you're making healthy or related claims, watch out. And if you um, have any of these suits, use the preemption defenses uh, because they can be very helpful. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison. Thanks, Trent. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess I'll kick off with my, uh, my favorite candy. I have to give you a, a caveat here. This is my favorite Halloween candy is 100 grand or baby roof. My favorite candy is actually a score bar, the Heath Bar's uh, thinner cousin, um, but you don't find those trick-or-treating. So I went with my, uh, my Halloween candy trick-or-treat. And I'm apologizing now for the haunted house sounds that are going to be hanging in the background. Uh, apologies, they're doing construction on the floor below us in the office today. So apologies for the, the bangs and, and woos here. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about the California ingredient ban and the New York ingredient ban and sort of where we are uh, with the FDA. So as you all may be aware, uh, October 7th, Governor Newsom signed a bill effectively uh, banning the following ingredients uh, in foods, uh, brominated vegetable oil, also known as BBO, potassium bromate, poly, uh, propyl paraben, and red dye number three. The bill was originally misnamed uh, the Skittles ban bill because the bill had originally had a ban on titanium dioxide, which is a, a coloring that's used in Skittles and many, many other candies. But there was a lot of press out there about the Skittles ban and, um, you know, California is going to take away your candy. Um, not not really the truth, as you know, the the Internet tends to tends to change, change facts a little bit. So what happened was this bill is going to go into effect in January 2027. Um, so the ingredients will no longer be permitted in food products. Uh, and the penalties for manufacture, sale, delivery, and distribution will be $5,000 for the first offense and 10,000 for subsequent offenses. What's interesting is at this point, um, and it may come out in the regulations as we get closer to 2027, it's not really clear what an offense is. Are we talking a packet of Skittles? Are we talking a pallet? Are we talking a warehouse full of product? Not really clear. And, you know, are, are we talking about each individual packet would be an offense? And so you get $5,000 fine for the, the first um, pack of cosmic brownies that might have, have this ingredient um, and then 10,000 for each additional. So not super clear uh, how that's going to be enforced, but that's, that's how it's written for the time being. So most of most of what you see in the photo on the right, um, those are the types of products that contain some of these ingredients, one or more. Many of them, uh, candy corn contains red dye three. Um, cosmic brownies contain uh, brominated vegetable oil, red dye number three. Potassium bromate is found. It's a dough elasticizer and is found in things like bread, tortillas, um, many baked goods, uh, uh, purple paraben, the same prepackaged muffins, cakes, tortillas, candies contain that. And then red dye number three, obviously candy, frosting, popsicles, um, even cereals and sadly maraschino cherries. So no more uh, dirty Shirley's, no more Manhattans with uh, maraschino cherries, at least not until the, the ingredients are changed. And should make it clear too that these ingredients are already uh, prohibited in food products in the EU, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, China, and Japan. So while this will require manufacturers to change their ingredients and, and change their recipes, um, this is not completely out of the blue. And, and if these products are being sold in those countries, 
odds are some manufacturers already have multiple formulas. So, you know, it will be a little bit of a, of a challenge for those companies who are manufacturing these ingredients. You're going to have to make a shift away from these ingredients. You're going to have to find uh, an appropriate substitute for these types of ingredients. And same with those who are using those ingredients in their products. There's going to have to be a shift. But California has given you until January of 2027. So there's some leeway here. So there, there's some, some window. But, um, you know, Skittles are not banned, and uh, at least not in California. So not to be outdone, New York has decided that, hey, we want to do this too. We want to ban stuff too. And New York has also proposed putting titanium uh, dioxide in the ban. Um, they have still included this, and I see the note just popped up. New York has still has titanium dioxide. Yes, they do. So it's back. This is our zombie ingredient. Um, titanium dioxide is, dioxide is still included in the ban in New York. So part of the really interesting thing about New York also is that this would go into effect two years sooner than the California ban. So this will have everybody scrambling a little bit um, if this goes into effect if this bill is signed as is and goes into effect January 2025, there's a much quicker runway, um, much less time to ramp up. So expect to see some challenges from those in the industry who are manufacturing. So an interesting also in New York, um, enforcement is typically including seizure of the product. Um, and in the law, as is currently written in the bill, it says that the recognition by FDA of any of the substances is safe is not good enough for a defense. So New York is effectively saying, FDA, you haven't done enough here. Just because you allow it, we're not gonna allow it in our products. So we've got New York and we've got California sort of ganging up on the FDA a little bit, saying you've taken too long. Um, you're, you're really not acting quickly enough. So the FDA has sort of ghosted the industry. Um, National Trade Association has asked the FDA to weigh in on the California ban. Um, I think that uh, you know, we're going to see more and more industry players ask the FDA to sort of step it up. Um, part of the problem is, as, as you're aware, as manufacturers in this space that you know, you've got multiple schemes and it's very difficult to comply with multiple schemes. Do you take the path um, and effectively say we're going to comply with the, the most stringent? Are you going to develop different products for different markets, as some have been doing now with the EU versus the U.S.? Um, so it, there's going to be some pushback we anticipate from the industry. Um, so FDA has been working on a proposed brominated vegetable oil uh, rule for about a year now. Um, no indication of, of where this is. If you go to the FDA's website, they'll even point you to their BVO page and say, hey, we're working on it. Um, they're also currently reviewing red dye number three and titanium dioxide as well. So titanium dioxide, our little, uh, our our zombie ingredient may come back again, and that one may be banned as well. But um, FDA had had those two proposals open for comment until earlier this year. There's really not been any additional motion that we've seen at this point. So an FDA has said that um, for direct food additive petitions, it can take about 24 months. And for color additives, the approval process can vary significantly. So no real indication from FDA on when they're going to make a movement on this section or on any of these ingredients or any of these additives. So we're going to continue to watch and wait. I think there's been a lot more pressure uh, from the public for them to maybe try to, to step up and move. But FDA's got their hands full with a lot of issues right now. As Trent has already discussed, we're also looking at, um, you know, new other ingredients that they're considering um, with things that ingredients that come in contact with food, things like packaging, um, nonstick materials. So they are they are reviewing a lot of a lot of different ingredients and a lot of different products. So FDA has their hands full. It's just a question of how quickly they're going to move forward. So I throw it back to Trent briefly to talk about the Voluntary Carbon Market Disclosures Act. And then after that, we'll flip it over to Royce. Yeah, thanks a lot, Allison. Really appreciate it. I'm just going to real quickly hit this uh, as we're running short in time. But this particular act was recently signed into law in California on October 7th. It aims to force companies to more clearly disclose the basis for their carbon reduction uh, claims and will take effect on January 1, 2024. Could have a significant impact on any companies that are making claims about their carbon reduction. 
Uh, just wanted to flag that for everyone. If you're not aware of this, please take a look at it. If you need any help, let us know. So with that, I'll turn it over to Royce. Royce? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. How is it going? I'm just going to do a little vibe check here. We're about to enter into Delta 8. Had a lot of uh, really important information thrown our way on this webinar, but about to go into Delta 8, the hemp world, so need to adjust our vibe accordingly. Uh, my, my favorite candy is absolutely not Butterfinger. Um, my favorite candy is Twix bars and the various iterations of the Twix bar that have occurred since the candy was first launched, including ice cream and all um, wonderful flavors. I heard there's a, a Twix bar pizza you can get somewhere. Haven't had that yet. Um, uh, it, so, so uh, we're keeping with the Hollywood theme. Uh, we're going to go on Delta Eight and Evil Spooky Wraiths. Uh, these are, uh, I think, spirits that you see before, uh, allegedly before you um, you die, but also spirits that you could possibly see while consuming Delta Eight, allegedly. Um, <clears throat> so, Delta Eight and Delta Ten, as you all know, with my mnemonic, Delta Eight is great to vape. Delta Ten is not ascend. Delta Nine possibly do some time. Um, they occupy a unique world of uh, legality uh, under the farm bill. And DEA has this year all but um, admitted that it doesn't necessarily have enforcement authority and is rapidly seeking to get that enforcement authority. Um, and because of that, they're, they've been uh, all over uh, convenience stores. I actually on my way over here today, I, I stopped in my local uh, convenience store to see what they had in inventory. Not that I do this, but I wanted to see what the how many new products came onto the market. So we've seen three new recent warning letters on Delta 8 products, a real uptick in FDA. Uh, and also the, the interesting thing about these warning letters is FTC jumped in for a little fun as well, which is interesting because we normally don't see FDA and FTC co-enforce in this space against Delta-8. Um, again, the warning letters, the, the way, in my opinion, you trigger increased scrutiny is all of these things on the right here. Best practice, don't make a product that tastes like um, yum berry uh, for children. Uh, don't throw the product into uh, something that is Halloween candy, like Delta-8 candy corn. Um, great way. And, and then you sell it um, in, in a place where children can frequent. Um, FDA has again come out and said this isn't a food additive. Um, this is not grass. This doesn't belong in food. Um, so it really, really kind of goes back to the old way we looked at CBD, which was like it's potentially legal as it exists in, an, in a, uh, a vacuum. Um, and FDA for the first time really harm, like harked on the cardiopulmonology and CNS risk related to Delta-8. Um, and that's, that's really where I think FDA is getting a little concerned is there have been increased reports of central nervous system issues and cardiopulmonology, which we know when there was always a risk of cannabis, uh, not that cannabis has killed anyone, but uh, it does mess with the, the cardiopulmonary system, can have other um, issues with other drugs when you take them. Uh, and FTC added in for the deceptive marketing and uh, appeal to children. The other thing that I wanted to bring up and just encountered this as well this week, um, I have seen an uptick in cyber attacks and cyber issues with food manufacturers and just wanted to give folks a little bit of a, a re, rebalancing here. If you own a food business in America or you're operating as a food business, cybersecurity and cyber defense matter. And yes, you can have your firewalls and you can have your, your antivirus, but we're talking like next level stuff. We're talking about a real cybersecurity continuity plan, backups, um, adherence to best industry practices, because one of the fears that FDA has here, as well as FBI and USDA, is that um, 
a, a potential attacker could either DNS, um, get your website down. That's, that's bad, but like not, not like going to kill anyone. But what they're really afraid about is getting into the systems and getting into internet of things and tweaking temperatures, uh, editing batch records, editing reports, um, messing with mixtures, uh, or more critically, attacking an entire industry and creating a food shortage or an issue there. So um, I have unfortunately seen two of these crypto wall attacks this year on food manufacturers. Uh, it is something to be very aware of. Also to be very aware of is dormant uh, malware. And FDA uh, has stated numerous times this year that they're they are really looking at uh, increasing and potentially creating a new guidance on cybersecurity and food defense as part of uh, health hazard analysis. And we also saw this um, as an emphasis in the national infrastructure plan. So just, you know, if you have any questions on that, obviously we have a great cyber defense team, but uh, I have been involved in these issues. I have worked pretty closely with double checking whether or not food systems were impacted and what kind of report we would need to make to FDA. So with that, I hand it off to my colleague. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I am Jenny Price and I'm in our Richmond office and I'm gonna be presenting on product labeling developments. My favorite candy is Reese's Pieces. I brought a little uh, pack to show you guys. I'm sure you all know what Reese's Pieces are though, but I ate them about 10 minutes ago. Um, and I also have on a pumpkin. I don't know if y'all can see it. I have a, a pumpkin light up. So happy Halloween, everybody. I hope everybody's gonna have a great uh, day and evening celebrating. So as Trent alluded to, ESG claims, um, environmental, social, and governance claims are still a huge topic, not just, or a huge uh, area for lawsuits, not just in the food uh, labeling world, but in products too. So the cases that I wanted to highlight really demonstrate in the product world um, how varied the, the class actions are that are being brought. Um, as Trent said, there's a Delta Airlines lawsuit that's been filed. Um, I had not seen, I think this is the first lawsuit for uh, the airline industry involving um, an ESG claim, and it's specifically going after Delta for its claim that it's carbon neutral. Um, Trent also talked about an Evian case, but um, Nike has been sued now in the uh, Eastern District of Missouri, <clears throat> excuse me, regarding sustainable clothing. And uh, Target has been sued in the uh, district court for the district, uh, the U.S. District Court for the District of Minnesota regarding um, clean and free of harmful ingredients for uh, beauty products. There uh, is a big push for standardization of sustainable claims. Um, the EU in March adopted um, some, you know, like draft, uh, I guess, um, regulations. It's called the Green Claims Directive. I would highly encourage anybody on this call that um, has ESG concerns and is in the EU to take a look at that. Um, there's a pretty good website that the EU has put out regarding Green Claims Directive and sort of the proposal that's been adopted uh, back in March of 2023. The FTC also has weighed in on with green guides. Um, it's not binding, but it does have like a best practices for um, recyclable, clean, sustainable, other ESG type um, claims on products. So that's definitely another great resource for folks. There are uh, the, the cases, the other cases, the other trends in the products world, um, our cosmetic cases are still regularly being filed. Um, you know, you've seen this with sunscreen and uh, claims and anti-aging. We've talked about all of those before and you're still seeing a pretty steady flow of cosmetics cases being filed across the country. Keep in mind, you know, this goes for any product, but particularly with cosmetic cases, uh, case with co 
cosmetics products is make sure your label is accurate, substantiate, substantiate, substantiate. We've said that you know numerous times on, on this webinar, but um, it is very true. And then just keep an eye, there's a lot of regulatory changes that are ongoing or on the horizon. So if you're in the cosmetics business, um, you know, I'm sure you're going to be watching for that because, you know, when the cosmetics industry went a long time without very many regulations and now it's a really hot topic. Um, and then the last trend is um, thread count cases. And that's why I have my little sheeted ghost right there over to the to the right of the, um, the text. But uh, thread count cases are still ongoing and um, being filed. There are at least two new lawsuits involving um, thread count cases. And again, going back to my earlier point about substantiating and making sure your label is accurate is would be helpful in those defenses. So this is a little bit out of, it's more in Trent's world, but I told Trent I was gonna mention that aspartame I think is gonna be, you know, the next um, you know, chemical that's sort of on the horizon for, for uh, potential lawsuits. The FDA recently rejected the WHO report listing aspartame as a carcinogen um, and cleared aspartame as long as it's used and consumed in common levels. Um, but I do think that you're going to start seeing some uh, class action lawsuits with aspartame, such as you know products that use aspartame, such as sugar-free candy, um, sugar-free gum, um, sugar-free sweeteners, and you know diet drinks. So we will. Uh, keep you posted on that. I'm going to throw it over to Trent real quick to talk about this slide. Yeah, sorry. I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, and, and so, you know, th there was a lot of press coverage about the decongestants and where an FDA advisory panel by a 16 to zero vote on September 12th uh, said that phenylphrine is not effective when ingested in tablet form and recommended that drugs containing it not be sold due to it not being efficacious. Um, there are 242 products that include this ingredient and they generated uh, close to $2 billion in sales in 2022. So you can probably predict what happened next, which is there have been a number of class action lawsuits filed against lots of defendants uh, in this space. Um, they are in their infancy, so we are we, we will be watching them. One such example is this one against Walgreens, but there are lots and lots of others. So this is one that we just wanted to flag for everyone to keep an eye on. And it's uh, another example of um, a regulator basically, you know, um, coming out with something saying that, you know, a particular ingredient is not effective um, and that leading to class action litigation. So uh, just keep an eye on this. Thanks, Trent. So Trent alluded to this earlier, talked about it earlier, uh, about preemption. And, you know, Trent and I were talking a lot about um, sort of the uh, common ground between, uh, we've talked a lot about how there are a lot more regulations um, that, you know, the regulatory agencies are getting more involved and, um, just a lot of a lot of regulatory movement recently, and you know Trent talked a lot about that in the in his trends section. But there's a um, interesting common ground that as the regulations have increased, the preemption defense has become more effective. Um, it used to be that you know. Um, we didn't see a successful preemption defense and a motion to dismiss stage for years. And we still see some, you know, you'll see my bullet point. You, you, we're still seeing some that aren't working and that, you know, are denied, but we're seeing more that are um, winning arguments. So Target just won a preemption argument in the U.S. District Court for the District of New York, Northern District of New York regarding a class action for hydrogen peroxide. Um, with the court holding that federal food, drug, and cosmetic cosmetic act uh, preempted, um, and then you juxtapose that against Tylenol, who just lost a preemption argument um, 
in the Southern District of New York. Um, and in that case, the Southern District of New York essentially said that um, it was a case regarding um, allegations that prenatal exposure to Tylenol causes autism. Uh, Tylenol said that it had complied with the FDA's required warning that essentially said, quote, if pregnant or breastfeeding, ask a health care, ask a health professional before use, end quote. The Southern District of New York said that while that uh, the FDA required warning um, was met, it is not the only an ex it's not the only exclusively allowed warning and Tylenol could have had a more specific warning about acetaminophen use during pregnancy. So there is still, um, you know, obviously cases that are denying uh, courts that are denying uh, preemption, but it is definitely something to consider. Um, and I, you know, and, and strongly consider preemption arguments and a motion to uh, motion to dismiss. And then lastly, uh, I wanted to talk about this case um, out of the Second Circuit and um, as just a reminder, because in this case, um, hours before um, the Southern District of New York granted summary judgment in full, there was a settlement agreement. And essentially what happened was there had been some uh, telephone conversations between the parties. And then there was an email that was sent by the uh, defense saying, um, I'm sorry, I need to plug my computer in. Um, can I have that, Jeff? Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so there was some telephone um, exchanges, uh, settlement was reached via telephone, and then there was an email follow-up stating that we can accept the additional terms you proposed yesterday, listed the terms of the agreement, and um, stated, I understand that now we have an agreement and you will begin to work on documentation. Um, after that, a couple hours later, uh, the court granted full summary judgment to the defendant um, who then tried to, you know, back out of the settlement agreement. Um, and this went up to the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit said that there had been a meeting of the minds and mutual assent to form a binding settlement agreement. Um, so that was essentially, um, you know, it's just a good reminder of if you have a uh, summary judgment pending out there, um, you know, Obviously, you need to be careful um, in settlement discussions, but the, the key being a meeting of the minds and mutual assent to form a binding settlement agreement will, um, you know, make a settlement agreement binding, at least in the Second Circuit. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Frank. Thanks, Jenny. Um, as is noted in my uh, in my opening slide. My favorite candy is Reese's cups, um, and while Reese's PCs and mini cups are delicious, uh, respectfully disagree with Jenny and Katie that they are the better of the Reese's. Um, and so, what I'm going to talk about briefly uh, for everyone is sales practices, litigation, development. Trent alluded to this at the beginning of the. Sh uh, the presentation that these cases have started to blow up. Um, and again, it, it sort of relates to, um, uh, it's this sales practice litigation and quote dark pattern litigation uh, are multifaceted way to challenge nearly every aspect of um, uh, online purchases, whether it's drawing the consumer in, tricking them in quote, tricking them into uh, buying um, products uh, they think uh, are quickly running out of stock or at this low price for only a couple minutes, um, and then also um, enrolling them in, in auto enrollment and services that they allegedly didn't want, um, all the while having these um, uh, recording these interactions and potentially tracking a bunch of data. Uh, from the consumer. So it re these really can touch on every single um, um, aspect of any transaction. Um, auto enrollment has been a big one uh, the, in the last several months, 
back in the summer, the FTC uh, brought an enforcement action against Amazon um, related to online and auto enrollment into Amazon Prime membership. Um, filed a heavily redacted complaint earlier this summer and then filed an amended complaint that ultimately included several um, Amazon executives. Um, Amazon moved to dismiss uh, saying that this is just an attempt by the FTC to uh, regulate through litigation, um, taking issue with um, the SEC, uh, essentially trying to hold uh, Amazon liable for actions uh, that are allegedly going to be illegal under a forthcoming promulgated rule. Um, so that was the sort of main gist of that, but also the executives were, including them was a little peculiar uh, because Amazon is such a big company. Uh, typically the FTC is not gonna uh, name these executives, but they brought them in and uh, the executives themselves also um, uh, moved to dismiss and, and took issue uh, with being named, um, essentially saying like we aren't some small company where only like one person has control and it might might make sense uh, to name individual employees. Um, you know, it's not like it's 1995 and Jeff Bezos is selling me uh, a copy of some of John of a John Grisham novel out of uh, his garage. Uh, this is a big company. Um, so, uh, and what's interesting is in addition to the defendants moving to dismiss the Chamber of Commerce and um, uh, Computer and Communications Industry Association actually chimed in um, and filed amicus briefs supporting Amazon's and the, and the executives positions, essentially saying like what Amazon was, is doing and the way that people are, are enrolled that's how a lot of companies do it. And this again is uh, the FTC's um, premature attempt to uh, regulate through litigation. Um, that said, Amazon did get a recent win uh, related to similar claims for their uh, audible um, audiobook subscription processes. The court um, dismissed the claims saying Consumer, uh, you were told that you would get a free audiobook and access to free audiobooks, and that's exactly what you got. And you know, you were auto enrolled, and you were told. Um, so that was a win on the consumer class action front for Amazon. Um, and then Google and YouTube uh, had and had very similar claims um, related to auto enrollment, where a California state court certified classes against them. But then um, uh, Google and YouTube tried to get them decertified, and the court again said no, no. Um, and then there's also been a recent one filed against Peacock, again, sort of the same allegations. Um, Keurig uh, recently got a win in an eavesdropping suit. Um, as I mentioned, online chat features um, providing to uh, companies, all of your information and monitoring how you use the website and, and just collecting that massive data um, can be, um, you know, quite extensive. Uh, California has a statute, the Invasion of Privacy Act, that makes doing this without consent illegal. Um, and so plaintiff here had alleged that she used a chat feature with Keurig online and uh, that her data was collected. Um, and the court dismissed it on standing and, and basically said, sure, you might have had your data collected, but, and that's a technical violation, but where's your actual injury, in fact? And so um, it, she had been given two or three times allowed to file a minute complaint and has yet one more shot to see if she can overcome um, the pleading uh, deficiency there. Uh, and finally, uh, or uh, next, no more hidden fees. California recently banned hidden fees in online transactions. Uh, basically, what the uh, bill out there seeks to do is sa it says you have to have full disclosure of the costs of the items, save for like government mandated fees or and or taxes. Um, essentially, 
requiring companies to be upfront with the full purchase price of um, products. Um, we have also seen in, at the federal level, uh, similarly, uh, a ticket act, um, the ticket act uh, that would make um, those who sell uh, tickets online to uh, to various events have to again be forthright and say here's the purchase price and here are all the fees and so here's your total transaction price and, and you don't get to wait until the end to tell the consumer that um, uh, Chick Fil A uh, recently settled uh, claims related to delivery fees and allegations that they hike their prices on deliveries. Uh, it's a, about a four and a half million dollar settlement with one and four five in cash. Uh, what was interesting with that settlement is that um, the one point four five million in cash um, is going to have doc, docked from it um, about a million dollars in attorney's fees and up to a uh, hundred thousand in uh, administrative costs, uh, leaving very little in cash there. Uh, and then finally, uh, Menards recently got a case. Uh, related to alleged hidden fees sent to arbitration. I just note that because uh, as we have presented on in the past, uh, a lot of <laughs> mitigation measures um, can be put into place, but always having an arbitration and class action waiver uh, can help with uh, combating these uh, at the end of the day. Um, and then finally, uh, there are a handful of uh, dark pattern uh, cases related to urgency. Um, Salins in an hour, only five products left. Last, like last seat at this uh, at this price. Uh, trying to get the 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 consumer to hurry up and buy, um, when in fact that's not uh, the case. Um, and th as we have listed here, there is a case filed against Old Navy uh, related to uh, allegedly face allegedly false time limits. Um, the New York AG just settled uh, for about two and a half million dollars uh, related to uh, discount ticket prices. Um, and then uh, Foot Locker just got hit with a class action um, about uh, scarcity of their available products. So again, just, uh, you know, all of these facets continue to be uh, challenged. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Talene. Hi, everyone. I'm Tolene Geddes in McGuire Woods' downtown Los Angeles office. My favorite candy is gummy bears. I usually have a pack of them hiding in my desk at any given time. Um, it is not a Halloween thing for me. It is a stress thing for me, and I uh, snack on them constantly. Um, so uh, I'm going to be discussing Proposition 65 updates with all of you. California's Proposition 65 presents significant litigation risk to businesses nationwide, whether or, uh, and oftentimes uh, Proposition 65 will also impact uh, litigation outside of California, um, even with products that are not necessarily regulated by Proposition 65. However, uh, federal preemption could weaken Proposition 65, like Dracula having uh, being exposed to the sun. On June 22nd, the U.S. House of Representatives introduced a bipartisan bill that would strip California of its ability to require Proposition 65 warnings on pesticide products. The bill is called the Agricultural Labeling Uniformity Act, and it would reinforce that only labels approved by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, can appear on pesticide package packaging and would directly preempt Proposition 65 warnings on pesticide products. So basically, this bill does three main things. It would clarify that only labels approved by the EPA under FIFRA are to be displayed on pesticide packaging. It also seeks to prevent states, instrumentalities, or courts from imposing any labeling or packaging requirements that differ from or are in addition to those approved by the EPA under FIFRA. And this would go directly to not having any Proposition 65 warnings on these products. 
And finally, the EPA administrator would be prohibited from, prohi from permitting any labeling that contradicts conclusions drawn from the human health assessments or carcinogenicity classifications performed under FIFRA. So basically what this would mean is that uh, if adopted, it would remove the requirement and prohibit Proposition 65 warnings for pesticide products since it would prevent, prevent any state instrumentality or political subdivision thereof from requiring labeling in addition to or different from the labeling or packaging approved under the EPA. Um, however, in addition, on June 22nd, 2020, the Eastern District of California issued a permanent injunction in the plaintiff's favor uh, in a case where plaintiffs were arguing that uh, there's not enough evidence to show that uh, glyphosate, which is one of the chemicals that uh, Proposition 65 seeks to uh, limit and um, basically uh, reduce the use of, um, causes cancer. And it means that, uh, and, they, and the court also decided that using those uh, cancer warnings would compel false or misleading speech. Um, the state has since appealed that decision, but it looks like Proposition 65, as far as uh, it relates to pesticide products, is getting it from both the national legislature as well as the California courts. And we could see a limiting action uh, on Prop 65 warnings apply to pesticide products in the new year. The next thing that I want to discuss is the large amount of chocolate litigation that we discussed earlier in the year. Um, if you attended our uh, webinar earlier this year, you know that in January 2023, we saw a large uptick in litigation against chocolate manufacturers. In September of this year, a California federal judge parred down the putative class action against the Hershey company because plaintiff failed to show that the lead or cadmium levels that she alleged were in the chocolate products create an unreasonable safety uh, unreasonable safety hazard. As a result, uh, a lot of the plaintiffs uh, were removed from the class action and a lot of the causes of action were dismissed. Nevertheless, the court has allowed for plaintiff to continue litigating uh, her claims as far as seeking an injunction for the company to disclose the presence of heavy metals within chocolate bars. However, this injunction would only require Hershey to disclose lead or cadmium levels when they are actually present. Um, overall, it looks like a big win for chocolate manufacturers, but we'll keep an eye on this litigation and continue to report, and continue to report back as we get more information. And with that, that's your Prop 65 update. Thank you, Talene. Um, and that will conclude our program. I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for attending today and thank our panelists, uh, did a great job. Uh, we may do a special webinar based on dark pattern uh, enforcement and litigation in the, in the next couple of months. So keep your eye out um, for that. Uh, invitation if you have any interest on that subject matter. Um, but for now, that is all we have, and I hope you have a great rest of your Halloween. Thanks for attending.